Hello everyone and welcome to this week's tutorial. First of all I would like to thank everybody who supported me here on YouTube and also special thanks to everyone who, who started to join my Patreon. Thank you guys so much. And this week I was feeling a bit uninspired and I was also busier than usual. So I figured why not make a tutorial that's more that's more beginner friendly and doesn't use VEX or any crazy setups. So this is a tried and tested effect that I that I came up with. It's a secondary fractured setup with some particles added. And I'm going to try to explain this like really at the beginner level. So if you're coming here from something like Maya or Cinema 4D, you're not gonna be overwhelmed by all the technical stuff. And I'm going to to explain the, the technical stuff that we are going to use in as much detail as possible. So yeah, let's get started. Okay, so here we are in Houdini, where I first of all imported this, this almond, which by the way is procedurally generated, both the, the shape and the textures. I'm gonna maybe do a, do a tutorial in the next weeks covering this, because it's a pretty interesting topic. I'm just apply, applying its material to it, having a, a node here to reference it just in case. Then I made it a little bit smaller. And from here on now, we are going to need to, to fracture it down into small pieces. And usually fracturing, especially with, with constraints and secondary fractures and things like that, used to be a really tedious and, and long process to do in Houdini. But we are really lucky that side effects have created this material fracture node which I'm going to, to explain in a bit and this has made the process of doing like multiple fractures and keeping track of the names and the, and the different constraint networks really easy. So what this material does is it basically just fractures your object and in the first tab here you have first of all you can have different types of material and it will it will adapt the the look of the pieces depending on it but here concrete looks just right for the for the look I had in mind here you just tell it how many times you want it to fracture so if let's say I get rid of this secondary fracture then this is like the first level of fracture and then when you add like a secondary level of fracture what it's going to do it? It's going to take each and every of, of these pieces separately, and it's going to fracture them one more time with the settings that you set specify in like the secondary fracture. Let me put that back. Okay, so here you're telling it how to scatter the points used for the fracture. So how how fracturing works inside Houdini is you give the fracturing some traditionally with like the, the older nodes where you had to do this manually you would scatter some points on the object either on the surface or using a volume on the inside and then based on these points Houdini is, was fracturing the object uh, with the oh with like the piece being centered in the in the point now with this node you don't have to worry about all of that you can just Tell it if you want this to be uh, fractured volumetrically or on the surface based on an attribute. Here I want it to be volumetric and I'm creating uh, 200 points for, for the first fracture and then each of those points gets fractured 20 more times so that's 20 each so 200 multiplied by 20 we will have 4,000 4, pieces here. Uh, what's also really cool about this node is that it allows you to create both edge detail and interior detail. So if we disable this, you will see that these pieces are going to be much more linear and boring. Same for interior detail if we add like an exploded view
So you can see that we have we have detail on the interior and these faces are not completely flat. You can increase how much how much these pieces get remeshed and how how fine the detail is. But here we are going to use this placement in the final render. So and there's the pieces are going to be relatively small. So I haven't worried about about adding detail that that much. But obviously you can here using the element size. And here on the interior size, same with like the noise amplitude. Uh, and here with the detail size, you can specify how how tiny you want the, the interiors of the pieces to be to be remeshed in order to to be able to add this kind of detail. Uh, another thing that it does really useful for us is that it creates constraint networks. And what constraint networks are are basically lines that connect points and how this works inside the simulation is that if two points are connected by a line here then Houdini considers uh, those points to be those pieces to be glued together and once either a certain threshold or force is applied to to that to those pieces or uh, as you will see later if we manually come and delete those inside the solver then those pieces are going to, to separate themselves and here we have three outputs out of the RBT material fracture here we have the actual geometry that, that the material fracture exports here we have the constraint networks and here we have the, the proxy uh, pieces which don't have like they are the same as if we didn't have any kind of detail and this is here in order to to help to help the solver the, the bullet solver not uh, not have to deal with like concave surfaces which really messes with with the way it works and it also can create like interpenetrations in collisions and stuff like that which make make the solver both slower and unstable and here you can basically simulate with these pieces and then at the end use the simulation to move the the detail pieces on on the same simulation so what i did here is i separated the constraints and then I split them based on their level using their constraint tag so that we have on this node we have only like the level 1 constraints and on this node we have only the level 2 constraints and why I did this is if we look at the video we will see that first there are some big pieces that separate and then as they get further from, from the surface they get, they get split again into smaller pieces and in order to, to control an art direct that I have to separate the constraint levels for like the first the first level of, of fracturing and then on the second level. Here I have created an assemble node with only create pack primitives enabled because this already connects the inside edges and it already creates a name attribute and we don't want that overridden because that name attribute is tied with the name in, in this constraint. If you, we go here to the if you go we go here to the constraint you will see that the points have the name of the piece they are they are tying together with with the other pieces. So if you are new to Houdini, what pack primitives are is a really efficient way to store geometry for, for RBD simulation purposes, where all the, all the geometry gate gets back down, baked down in a format that's really memory efficient. And all you have here are the pieces displayed. And if we go to wireframe mode and enable points, you will see that all of them get get the attributes stored on a single point that lives in the in the centroid of each of the pieces and this is how you you generally prepare prepare geometry for an rbd so that it is as fast and as memory efficient as possible here 
here what I did is create a group where I selected a piece that's going to be inactive like that then here I have created an active attribute and set it to 1 for all the pieces and then I overread that just for this group which has that piece on top there uh, and I overwrote that to 0. What the active attribute does, it's pretty self-explanatory, it's uh, the pieces who have who have this attribute set to 1 are going to be affected by the simulations and the one that don't have it are not gonna be affected by the forces in the simulations but are still gonna gonna collide so by doing this we make sure that the almond stays in one place as the the dynamic pieces get get split and move move down from it from here we move into the dotnet but actually before getting into the dotnet i have to show you one more thing here one more thing i created is a really basic pyro simulation which i'm using in order to to move these pieces in a more interesting and organic way so what i did was i created a basic pyro source which is initialized to smoke and I used the volume scatter then using a volume rasterize attributes I just rasterize the density and temperature attributes so this just takes attributes out of these points and turns them into volumes it, this is a pretty a pretty basic sub, sub level pyro setup then here in this pyro I increase the resolution a bit then in the shape I've inverted the buoyancy so the smoke goes down and not up I and then I've set it to a really small value and I added some turbulence and messed with the turbulence value and made the swirl style smaller a bit and this is all I did here and the result looks like this we don't need a simulation that's like crazy detail or something like that because we, we are only going to use the velocity field that this that this simulation exports in order to, to add vector pieces. Now inside the dotnet I'm just importing the, the pieces using an RBD packed object. And I set that to first context geometry. Here I have the default settings on a, on a, on a rigid body solver set to bullet. And then here I experimented with some pop wind, but then I found out that it's more organic and interesting with, with the pyro way. So this is the pyro back by volumes, which I just pointed to, to the velocity volume on the sub level. And I set it to update velocity instead of force, which makes the particles or pieces follow the, follow the pyro simulation more precisely than having this set to force. And here I created two constraint networks pointing to our two levels of uh, pointing to our two levels of fracturing, level one and level two. I added the glue constraint relationship. This is set to default. I haven't messed with it. I just changed the data name to glue because if we go to our material fracture, you will see here that our glue constraint name is glue. You can change this to custom if you to something custom if you want to like have multiple constraints or separate constraints or something like that. And here is the trick. If you connect the sub solver here and you go not to the top geometry but to the relationships geometry, here you can see the constraints as we saw them at sub level and uh, here you also have access to like sublevel nodes. So what I did was just using a, bound, uh, a delete set to bounding. I animated the delete growing, going up and removing constraints as as the simulation progresses. And here is how you deactivate manually and you are direct glue constraints. 
And now in order to create that, that effect where the pieces first get separated and then get, they get fractured one more time, here I did the exact same thing, but if you look at the keyframes, I've offset those by, by one second. So we have some delay between the first level and the second level fracturing. By the way, you can add a third level, add swap level in the material fracture, add another, uh, another copy of those nodes here and do this on and on for as many times as you want. And this is the RBD. And you can art direct how much time it takes for for the pieces to get to get fractured one more time by by messing with the keyframes here, putting them earlier or later in, in the simulation. And this is the RBD part. Here I'm adding normals to the pieces. Then you will see some, some normal errors on the surface, like here and here. And how I fix that is I do an attribute transfer between the original geometry and the fractured geometry. But here I made sure to only transfer to the outside group, so only the surface of the of the almond gets the, these normals here, not the inside. The inside are going to be to stay the same normals that we computed here. Here I'm assigning another material just for the uh, interior using the group inside. Those groups inside and outside are groups that are created by by the material fracture node for us, so we already have them there. This node uh, transform pieces based on that name attribute is just transforming our high detail uh, pieces using the simulation information from the low proxy pieces that we had in the third input. And it does that based on the name attribute. And this is uh, this is where the RBD parts end. I have a file cache here to, to cache down the pieces. Then here is the pop part where I've used a debris source, which is a node that can detect where, where some surfaces got separated from each other and it enables you to burn particles from those surfaces. And here the only thing I did was increase the density scale a little and increase the, the lifespan to 100 because I don't want the particles that get sourced from this to die quick. I want them to live for as long as, as the simulation. Here what I did is first of all I deleted all the particles that have an age zero meaning that they are staying in one place. So all those gray, part, gray particles that haven't been activated yet by the debris source, I delete those. And then I delete all the particles that have an age that's bigger than 0.05 seconds because I just want this to pop into existence, burn particles and then, and then disappear. I don't want this to be like a constant emission of particles from these areas because that would look weird. Here we have a really basic pop net where I'm just sourcing all the points using the first context, context geometry and that's all I changed here. The particles already have velocity that they inherit from, from the simulation. If you want to make that faster or slower, you can play with the inherit velo velocity attribute here. but. I found the defaults to look pretty good here, but feel free to play with that if you want to. So this was the tutorial, I hope this was really helpful for you and I hope this was not scary at all for beginners and people coming from, from something like Cinema 4D or maybe Maya, which are not used to, to Houdini and still find it scary and tedious maybe. And I would like to once again thank you all for the support, especially to my patrons. And I'm looking forward to see you next week and bye bye.